Okay, so I thought we'd do now um, a little analytical meditation and just kind of bring it home into our personal situation. So if you want to get yourself a posture that feels stable for meditation, we'll do one of those now. And so come back to your bodhicitta motivation that the purpose of my life is to free all living beings from suffering, bring them the perfect happiness of enlightenment. And in order to do that, I must become enlightened. I must understand cause and effect, the causes of happiness and suffering within my own self. the better I'm able to prevent and dissolve negative states of mind, the more I'm able to purify past negative states of mind, the less suffering I'll have. The more I'm able to develop positive states of mind and actions, the more happiness I'll have. So this path to enlightenment benefits both myself and others in the immediate as well as the long term. Just let that motivation sink in. If you'd like to adjust it into your own words, just really let altruism resonate. And shift your focus to the breath. And we're focusing on the breath just to allow the surface distractions to settle. There is no need to control or judge your breath. Just know it and watch it as if merging with it. When the urge to analyze arises, just gently remind yourself that analysis is coming. Right now, just focusing on the breath.
When you're breathing in, simply know that you're breathing in. When you're breathing out, simply know that you're breathing out. And now shift to analysis. And we start by just identifying attachment, just becoming very clear about what it is we're actually working on dispelling. Attachment exaggerates the good qualities. Because of the exaggeration attachment does to both people and things, it gives us an unrealistic expectation of the amount of happiness these things can, quote, give. Attachment only sees the actual features that are good in isolation not seeing the rest of the traits of an object or person, the focus is narrow and limited. Because of the mistaken way attachment sees things, it thereupon drives us to seek and possess them, but then is disappointed or confused when the negative negative traits eventually come to light. And so then now becoming more specific, conjure up a sense of what attachment feels like when you're in it. What do you say to yourself under its influence? For example, do you say, I just need to have blank and then things will be fine. Or if only this person would blank, then we would be harmonious. Too much of this, not enough of that. Just really go into what do you say to yourself under the influence of attachment?
And then shift to thinking about how do you feel when attachment takes over? Are you more likely to be excited? Do you get hungry or scattered? Kind of crazy happy or needy? What's the experience? When attachment is taken over, do you feel insecure or out of place? Lonely or tired? What do you say and do under the influence of attachment to others? Maybe eating out of boredom or saying to other people, what are you doing? Throwing out hooks or chasing objects of the senses. Are you sometimes plastic happy? It doesn't really matter what style attachment takes for you. More important is just to know your style of attachment. And see if you can genuinely and authentically conclude that attachment is deceptive, harmful, and to be abandoned. And you can land on that conclusion by maybe reminding yourself of poor choices you might have made in the past out of attachment. What seemed like a good idea at the time and why? Was there a story? You can remind yourself of a time when you jumped into a decision or bought something out of excitement and then brought it home and were disappointed. How did you justify those decisions at the time? What were you thinking or not thinking? Did you lie to yourself? Are attachment objects deceptive? When the disappointment dawned or reality dawned, were you surprised at yourself for having made that jump decision? Mad at yourself? 
So just explore a little bit your decision-making process when attachment is driving. And then lift yourself into remembering when decisions have been more effective and beneficial without attachment driving. So just remind yourself that you're not always under the influence of attachment so coarsely. Sometimes love is driving or wisdom. So just kind of compare your decision-making processes when attachment is absent. And now dedicate the mental energy you put into these thoughts to developing your full potential for infinite benefit to all sentient beings. And relax your attention. Okay, so does anyone feel comfortable um, sharing any little insights or um, resistances or anything like that? So I realized during this meditation that uh, one of my attachments is, uh, uh, as I'm living with two kids and a husband, it's too in in the middle of COVID just like anyone else, uh, to sort of get space for myself which is sort of not paying attention to anyone else. So like attachment is, when attachment is driving me, uh, I fix fix with my own stuff sort of and occupy myself. Yeah. Um, And do you find that you need more physical space when you have less mental space? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And it's never enough. So it never helps actually. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But it's like, then you can touch into it of, oh, that's attachment, actually, because if it was actually the amount of space, then it would feel the same always. But sometimes the amount of physical space is fine. And sometimes it feels oppressive and claustrophobic. You know, if it was actually the space, you know, there would be a different mental experience. That's, um, 
Yeah, that's a, I, I have that one a lot too, Pia. That's <laughs> my um, go-to of, I need space. Oh, wait, I need mental space. Oh, wait, meditate. <laughs> you know, but it feels like somehow the space is fault. <laughs> I was just wondering, would you say attachment to self is self-grasping? Self-grasping is... Uh, kind of a bigger topic and there's a lot of different kinds of self-grasping. There's the self-grasping we normally talk about in Buddhist conversations, the self-grasping ignorance, which is the root of samsara. And that is viewing the I in your own mental continuum and holding it to exist inherently. And then you get attached to things that seem to benefit that I. So it's kind of like more sequential Yes. So, yeah. So what you're saying, generally speaking, yeah, that's quite true. Um, but technically, you know, it's kind of like ignorance first, attachment second, <laughs> you know, but then attachment is just kind of then always. But what happens is that because we have the wrong idea about ourself, we really get attached to things that seem to benefit it and really aversion to things that seem to harm it. Yeah, and if we didn't have that mistaken idea of self, we wouldn't have then attachment and anger. It just wouldn't make sense to have it. We wouldn't need to then like work on it or try to dispel it. It just wouldn't make sense to begin with and it would just not be an issue. So, you know, that's why in Buddhism we talk about kind of the two sides of the path, the method side and the wisdom side. The wisdom side will cure the whole problem, the wisdom realizing the lack of an inherently existent self. But that's hard, right? Like that's philosophically complex, that's experientially complex, and it's going to take a while for us to realize it directly, even though an intellectual understanding is actually very useful on its own. But it's going to take a while before it kicks in. The method side of the path has a lot more things we already understand even before we were Buddhist. We already understand a little bit about patience. We already understand about connecting with contentment and love and things like this that antidote attachment. So we can kind of prevent negative states of mind from arising by keying into our understanding of patience, love, contentment, these things, and kind of put a lid on the tendency for attachment. But we don't have enough mindfulness to maintain it so then it will creep back in when there's an opening or a gap in our mindfulness. Yeah, did that, did that answer your question? Oh, that was fabulous. It, it cleared up other things as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> and um, then Eve, did you wanna add something? Yes, um, thank you. You kind of just answered uh, my observation, which is that uh, all the anger and contempt that I feel when my expectations are not meant, I think, well, I have to address the anger or the contempt or the, you know, the impatience with people. But I really have to look at both sides, especially the attachment that gives rise to the negative emotions. So you really just said that, but uh, I guess it's common. Thank you. Yeah, but you know, you're welcome. But yeah, I think that's a powerful thing about Buddhism is that it really helps us unpack the relationship between anger and attachment. It's so hard when you're angry to tell yourself, don't be angry, you know, like that works, you know, calm down. It's like, whatever, too late. But if you kind of rob it of fuel by thinking, all right, what was I expecting to happen that didn't happen? 
what was I attached to and assuming was possible that never was, it kind of robs the anger of fuel and then it just kind of peters out. You know, so sometimes that can be a lot easier just experientially than saying to yourself, oh, anger is not justified, cultivate patience. And you're going through all of this analysis and the analysis can even escalate the anger when you're in the middle of anger. Rather than do that, you can just kind of rob it of fuel by um, robbing it of the attachment that preceded it. Or, you know, go for a walk <laughs> yeah. and come back to your triggers after you settle down. Yeah. Venerable, I had a um, really interesting insight. It actually kind of, I think, dovetails on what you're just talking about now. Um, I realized when, when I sat with um, some of my attachment patterns, what came up for me was so much shame. Yeah. And, she, but, and, and I, I was feeling very much in the hole of shame because that's what that feels like to me. Um, although I also recognized how helpful shame can be because not only did it help me to deeply understand what the impact was of my behavior and my thoughts, but also motivates me not to, or to at least try to, to um, not, it, to, to detach. Yeah, yeah, and you're describing the the Buddhist definition of shame, which is a virtuous mental factor, as opposed to the colloquial definition of shame, which is way over identified and way too painful and is really afflictive and full of all sorts of over identification mess. So yeah, what you're describing is is the correct kind of shame, which is just to say, this is not who I am or who I want to be in this world, with a deep connection to your Buddha nature. Yes, yes, you yes. Know, that's where the identity is, not with the affliction or the mistake. It's just, you know, connection to your Buddha potential. Right, right, because that's the um, detachment. That's yeah. what the process of detachment, which I found was, was, which is also so important to know how to detach as that being a process, as, as it is for me to recognize how I get attached or when I go into aversion. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for that meditation. That was really helpful. Oh, good. Yeah. D did it, I'm glad. Yeah. D did anyone have any um, kind of pushback feelings? Because that's totally useful as well, or any resistance, um, or or more insights to share. Hi. Yes. It's it's not that though. It's a question that I have sure. that I'd love. Um, when you're attracted to someone, I don't want to drag you down the whole karma thing again because I know you want to <laughs> But is is that just because I remember um, Venerable Rabina saying that eye consciousness can only see shape and color. <laughs> so the rest of the attract attractiveness is um, the mind. And I'm so deliciously and horribly aware of how crazy <laughs> my mind can be. Um, but if you're really attracted to somebody, is that also because you have a really karmic connection with them? Because there's somebody, I won't give too many details, that I'm very attracted to but I don't particularly find them attractive. <laughs> it's just that <laughs> there's, there's just so, so much and feeling. And yeah, I just wondered what, what that meant from my karmic past, if anything. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I don't have the clairvoyance to see uh, karma or anything in particular because <laughs> I have no clairvoyance. But um, mm. you can make an educated guess that that's the case, you know, when you're have a sense of familiarity in particular with someone that you don't know, but you feel like you already know them. Of course, there's psychological mm. reasons for that as well. And, you know, they remind you of this and this and this. So there's, you know, things within this life that will make you feel familiar or attracted um, that, you know, psychologists could explain in great detail. Karmically, um, also, there's that you've probably been close to each other recently or often and probably mutually beneficial recently or often. It doesn't mean that it's like faded or good in and of itself, but it could be that you could pick up where you left off and continue a positive relationship. Or it could be that your expectations are so flared up because of this lovely warmth you feel that we ruin it for ourselves because we kind of over anticipate and over expect and you know, stuff like that. So I think that the useful thing is to say, 
there is a connection here. How can I make sure it's healthy? Mm. You know, because of course it's hard to make connections with people. And so if you're having a connection, you know, it's, it's, it's worthwhile exploring that, but Mm -hmm. to really say, let's make sure from the very outset of this life, we're doing it as healthy as we possibly can. And really, you know, lots of love, really less attachment. And when I feel that like excited, I need you go, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> I have moving. a question. Um, sure. I don't know if this was discussed earlier, but the advice that you gave just was helpful too. Um, how do you not get attached to um, an abusive mother? Like she's the source of origin and you try to, you know, have a, or your idea of like what a mother should do or whatever. Mm. Um, it, 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 it's, um it's not who she is but then it's still it's like i am also i come from you how, how is it that you you know um i guess i'm i'm trying to say how do you different differentiate attachment to a sense of duty and obligation yeah yeah that is that's that's the really key question and it's applicable in your specific situation as well as just kind of universally of what is a what right do we have to say this is the way you're supposed to be in this role because there are societal things and you know social contracts that we have and some of them are really logical and useful and create a peaceful, harmonious society. And some of them put us into a trap of saying, if it doesn't look like this, it's bad or someone's wrong or deficient or to blame or et cetera, rabbit hole. And so, you know, whether it's a marriage or it's a parent dynamic or whatever it is to ask yourself, okay, objectively in the world, we say that parents are supposed to do this, 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 and this, because that leads to a happy, healthy individual with the greatest potential to integrate positive qualities, you know? So generally speaking, you know, the kid needs to be safe and fed and loved and et cetera, you know? And that's a useful tick list. It's not like we throw out that tick list and say that people um, don't have to do that if they're parents, they can just give birth and run. You know, it's not like we suddenly say those things aren't true, but what we want to say to ourselves is that's a general rule that's generally useful, but the individual experiences are all unique. You know, so what does love and affection look like when it comes from this individual in front of me? And did I receive it, you know, whether it was the style that worked or a way that was skillful, let's just take some space for a second and ask, was there affection there? You know, I would have died without her in the beginning. You know, I I managed to become an adult, you know, so that had, she had an influence in me managing to become an adult, even if she was only there for crucial survival things you know, and probably there's more than survival things that she offered. The problem is, is that we're expecting it to look a certain way. And then we get resentful, because it didn't look that way. And the other problem is that we can think if we're getting quote, too Buddhist or misunderstanding Buddhism, we can think that people aren't accountable for bad behavior. You know, it's okay to say, when you did this and this, it really had a negative effect. And I need to take responsibility for that effect now that I'm an adult, but it's important for me to, to tell you about the impact that that has. It's hard because you, it's so easy to then turn that into blaming or turn that into something that's really unhealthy, but kind of just speak in truths when people are receptive and open to truths can be useful but you have to really read it in the moment because some people are not open to hearing the truth because they have so much of their own trauma that they're working through. So whatever our parents were supposed to be and weren't is a conversation to have with yourself and a conversation to have with your therapist and you know maybe close friends. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, because, you know, having compassion for for the people in our life who maybe were unskillful and had a negative effect in terms of being a condition, they would not have been that negative condition for us specifically if we specifically had not created the cause for that in the past. They might have still had that behavior and that tendency, but it would have landed on someone else. So the fact that it landed on us, we have some karmic stuff there to work on. And so if we're responding from a spiritual path perspective and an altruistic path, then we're finishing that negative karmic cycle and not creating a whole new one. And that's worth celebrating. Yeah. Even if it's painful. Yeah. So gently, gently, because it's not like we're pretending there are no social contracts and that, you know, marriage doesn't mean this or marriage does mean that. And, you know, you it can get into this funny negotiating thing where it, the basis was love, but then it turned into attachment negotiations of what is a balanced relationship, you know, and everyone knows that in a relationship you all take turns being the strong one or the weak one you all take turns being the one who brings abundance or has deprivation you know you take turns it's not like things are perfectly balanced all the time you know we'll do an equal amount of chores you know or an equal amount of whatever it's like life's not that tidy so it, it can even out in the end or not and all of that is fuel for the spiritual path it just, it becomes a personal conversation with yourself of how much is too much for you to take on the path at your level right now. So if you have a difficult relationship with someone like a parent, you can say, all right, I can handle an hour <laughs> with them and maintain an altruistic motivation and not get triggered. But I know that my mental space and my, you know, kind of focus capacity isn't able to be there for two hours or a weekend or whatever without me sliding into some sort of old pattern. So for the sake of myself and my sa the sake of the parent, I'm only gonna be there for an hour. You know, those kind of conversations that you have with yourself that are not letting them off the hook or letting you off the hook, but also are spacious and friendly enough to recognize that our best aspirations we cannot bring into daily life with a long duration yet. We're working on it. You know, so like boundaries, not barriers, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's so individual. You just, what makes sense for you in that relationship? We'll have a, um, a break for, I think, let me just double check. I think an hour, is it? Yep. And um, see you after the break. <laughs>